I'm James Beckwith, President and CEO of Five Star Bank. As a community bank, we believe that open dialogue about the issues affecting our region is vitally important. From the economy to the environment to social issues, we look forward to the conversations and hope you'll join in. In 2011, public safety and California economic conditions met in a perfect storm. While our state's budget deficit soared to record heights in the midst of the Great Recession, the Supreme Court ordered California to reduce its prison population of 237% capacity by May 2013. In order to implement this decision, Governor Jerry Brown signed into law AB 109 that transferred substantial responsibility for the state's prison population to the counties, along with new funding to pay for this expanded role. These changes are referred today as criminal justice realignment. New responsibility, new funds. Is it enough? And how should those funds be spent? Joining us today on Studio Sacramento, our Sacramento County Sheriff, Scott Jones, West Sacramento City Councilman, Oscar Villegas, and Assembly Member, Dr. Richard Pan. Welcome to the program. I'm gonna read a quote from Justice Anthony Kennedy. If a prison deprives prisoners of basic sustenance, including adequate medical care, the courts have a responsibility to remedy the resulting Eighth Amendment violation. So Sheriff, what is realignment? Well, I think what it is and what it purports to be are a couple of different things, but at its core, uh, realignment is a, uh, a transferred mandate, if you will, from the state to the local levels uh, to not only house the prisoners, but to uh, try and come up with evidence-based programs to rehabilitate, to uh, lower the recidivism rate uh, of the state. Um, that's basically it at its core. Okay. And Dr. Pan, why did this happen? Why was this necessary? Well, you know, as you mentioned uh, in the introduction, uh, the federal courts had stated that uh, overcrowding in our prisons has gone on for too long. It violates the constitutional rights of the prisoners. The courts have already stepped in in terms of health care as well. And basically, uh, the path we were on was unsustainable. Uh, we have one of the largest uh, prison populations in, in, in the country, our state. Uh, uh, the the process in which we are uh, going in criminal justice, we had a, a, a um, high recidivism rate where uh, people were coming back into the prisons and certainly the expense of taking care of all these prisoners. And so um, we need to take a step forward and say there's got to be a better way of doing things. And uh, I think the hope of uh, realignment is, is that uh, by basically uh, taking the uh, prisoners who were uh, I guess least dangerous, mm -hmm. uh, the so-called non-non-nons, uh, and, and have them closer to the communities, uh, working with uh, local uh, law enforcement, that that, uh, where uh, actually local law enforcement, the sheriffs have shown that they've done a better job in terms of uh, uh, transitioning them back into uh, into civilian life, and these these are prisoners who will eventually get out. I mean, they're not, right, so they're, I mean, they're not, and that, uh, therefore, we're gonna be able to lower our overall uh, prison rate as well right. to ensure that these people are going to be able to be uh, hopefully back in, you know, be able to reintegrate into society being productive sure. members. Sure, but, but, but Dr. Pan, um, the, there may be evidence to show that local law enforcement has done a better job, but it was with a smaller population. Uh, the jury's out as to whether or not there's enough funding to actually match the mandate that's come down. Isn't that correct? Well, you know, the, as, as you mentioned earlier, these are tough budget times. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, personally, I'd like to see that uh, there was more funding or money for this, uh, but also the path we were going was also unsustainable as well. Un understood, but then I'd like to come to Councilman Villegas and ask you, as a city councilman, if I'm one of your constituents, mm -hmm. what does this mean to me? Well, what it means is that now the, the responsibility of managing this population is squarely in the lap of local communities. Um, we have to figure out a way to make this work. Um, what it means is that it's in, in three years, three, four, five years from now, it's not as if the state is going to say, well, this, this attempt to try and sort of realign these prisoners locally didn't work, and we're going to take them back. That's not going to happen. So that option isn't on the table anymore. So what it means is, as to residents is 
your local communities, your policymakers need to figure out a way to do better than what the state was previously doing. The real question, Councilman Villegas, is this. Are we going to be less safe? I think the jury is still out. It's still early. Um, you know, that's, the fact is we've only been in this sort of realignment mode for less than a year. Um, we've been doing business forever the same way, and to expect results overnight is, I, th I think, a bit unrealistic. Mm -hmm. and the jury is still out. It's going to take a little bit of time. It's going to take two, three years to figure out whether or not the sort of the new way of doing business is going to have the effect that we all better hope it does. Mm -hmm. I, Sheriff I Jones, to that if, I, I'd if I could, like you to. The, on the, from the public safety perspective, I believe that people are going to be less safe, at least in the short term. Now, uh, I'm not an, uh, an opponent of realignment, uh, a well thought out, methodical, deliberate attempt to realign offenders to the local level. That's not what this is. It's important to understand that this was driven by um, a state in crisis uh, that was an economic crisis that failing to to um, comport with the court's mandates over time. This administration, as well as the last administration, has more as much or more fault than this administration. Um, Actually, doesn't this problem go back several it, it administrations? Does. It, it certainly both, does. Both Democrat and Republican. <laughs> Absolutely, it is. It is a completely nonpartisan uh, blame <laughs> here. Mm -hmm. um, you have uh, a infrastructure that hasn't built any prisons for a couple of decades, uh, even though we've had exploding populations. But going back to the original question of whether I think people will be less safe, I think it absolutely is true. You have a population. One of the things AB 109 did was shorten sentences. I don't know if most people realize that. What do you mean by that? Well, if you were sentenced to a year in county jail prior, you would get up to a third of your sentence off for what they call good time and work time. That was increased to 50%. So people are doing less of their sentence than they were before, AB 109. So you have a group of folks that are out of custody that ordinarily would have been in custody. Now, we know what the recidivism rate for someone in custody is, zero. No one reoffends while they're in prison. Hmm. But we also know with a statistical certainty that when you get out of jail, uh, over 70% of the folks that get out of jail are going to reoffend. By their own admission, any program to reduce recidivism is going to take two or three years minimum to gauge any efficacy from that program. Well, what do we do in the meantime, the two or three years? You have a group of folks that we know with statistical certainty are going to reoffend by a large majority that otherwise wouldn't have been able to offend. And when, and when they do reoffend, what are the tools that you as law enforcement and your colleagues have to keep us safe? Well, it's, it's interesting. You mentioned the funding. We, we, it does come with a considerable amount of funding. To the casual observer, you'd say that's a lot of money to be able to do these rehabilitative programs. But there's a cost. Uh, there's direct cost and indirect cost to our agency, sheriff's departments in particular, because we have to house. We don't get the luxury of building out programs to match whatever we get. We get what we get. And we don't get to give the inmates back if the funding diminishes. We have them. Let me just make sure I understand. So we get what we get. In other words, if you have money, if you're being given money for 100 prisoners, but you end up being sent 200, you just have to deal with it. That's correct. Yeah, that's correct. And is that what you're dealing with now? That is what I'm dealing with. I think that's uh, a common uh, phenomenon from, from all the counties. I mean, what this AB 109 did with all this money is create the expectation uh, mm -hmm. that there will be all this money is going to go towards rehabilitative type programs, which I'm a big fan of. I've been the commander of our jail. You cannot arrest your way or build your way out of the prison problem. Uh, I'm a big fan of it. But it's reasonable to assume that this was envisioned as a cost-saving measure by the state. So they figured out what it cost to house and supervise them under prison and parole, cut that by some amount, whether it's 10, 20, or 50 percent, doled it out to 58 counties and said, now you house and supervise them. Oh, and by the way, we want all this money to go towards rehabilitative type programs. So you can easily see, just looking at it logically, that it's, that it's underfunded to, do, to accomplish the goals that we are trying to do. Dr. Pan, as a member of the legislature, give us a sense of the debate as it stands today between uh, the allocation of these funds. Sure. Well, you know, as I mentioned before, uh, we're on a sustainable path. And so, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, I want... Well, before, let me just interrupt you. Before, unsustainable from the standpoint of we just keep locking people up, we, yeah, or unsustainable is that we're not letting them go fast enough. Well, uh, we just keep locking people up and the, expo the expense of that, we talked about prison construction, extremely expensive. Um, we were f uh, facing the deadline with the uh, federal courts uh, and it wasn't, this is not something that's brand new uh, for years and years and years and I think the courts are getting kind of exasperated that we weren't doing anything. So, uh, you know, in terms of the public safety, you know, certainly uh, one of, you know, we've been working with the sheriff and other people in the county to try to figure out what we can try to do uh, with realignment, but also recognize the alternative mm -hmm. was is that we were going to have a court case that said that you now have to do something with all these prisoners, either let them go or, 
and we'll probably find some places for some of them and so forth, but I think we were still heading down the path where uh, I think uh, we're concerned about public safety as well. So it, it's certainly not with uh, uh, um, any uh, joy that we're saying that uh, we uh, that that we could uh, send the prisoners to the uh, sheriffs and uh, and and try to work with the counties to try to be sure that there you know, was funding to help not only and I, I certainly uh, appreciate what the sheriff has to, the challenge that he's facing and all the folks in the county because uh, as he said and as we mentioned is is that the uh, rehabilitation takes you know it's going to take uh, at least a few years if not longer so and so if uh, councilman in hearing that you're the first phone call mm -hmm. that a citizen uh, is likely to make what do you tell them in terms of <clears throat> how this gets fixed well there's a couple of different things we're doing for example and i can speak specifically to yolo county because mm -hmm. west sacramento is in yolo county and i can tell you um early on it was difficult to, to sort of d develop a plan to say here's what we're going to do f forever um, because the money was uncertain it was unclear exactly how much money funding, funding was going to become available so early on we said okay let's just take inventory of what resources do we have locally what kind of data do we have to say here's sort of the starting point for this program because we've only been in it nine months so what we've done is essentially said here's the data here's what we currently have here's an inventory of the services and programs that we think we're going to need and over the next several months we're going to try to better refine that so that as time goes on we're able to invest in the programs and the services and the things that folks are going to need coming back into our communities because we know they're not getting them right now mm -hmm. so that call I mean as I said the jury is still out it's not clear whether or not this is going to work but frankly we don't have an option we have to make it work well uh, well I want to come back to uh, uh, what the what caused this problem in the first place and I know that there's a myriad of factors let's pick one mm -hmm. in 1994 three strikes was passed and the theory behind three strikes if memory serves me correct is somebody offends you lock them up long enough to where they're so old that they're too creaky mm -hmm. to do anybody much damage by the time they get out mm -hmm. and so we had a big run up in terms of prison population we had prison construction and the second part of the argument was rehabilitation just doesn't work. Warehouse, not rehabilitate. Where are the success stories? Where are the best practices at? What is it that gives both of these gentlemen, all three of you, comfort that whatever is done other than inc incarceration actually returns people to productive parts of society? There are programs all over the country and all over, all over California that actually pr that are proven to work. Um, they're not going to work for everybody all the time. Um, what we're doing locally actually is we're instituting a risk needs assessment. So rather than simply saying everybody coming out is going to get the same level of service all the time, we know that's a colossal waste of money. We know that the fact is, and as the sheriff alluded to earlier, statistical evidence shows that certain percentage of the, of the folks coming through are going to reoffend. So rather yeah, than yeah, but the, the 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 success rate is this: if seventy percent. Mm -hmm. of offenders reoffend again mm -hmm. that doesn't sound like much of a success rate that that's what's currently happening that's right, right. so and if we can move that off to 55 or 60 percent we've already made progress so I'm half as likely to to be held up well right. I, right? I, I, I I think that um, you know we we'd certainly have to do better than that um, I actually appreciate the fact that I had an opportunity to uh, tour the Roger Bauman Center and see the things the Sheriff's Office actually is doing to help mm -hmm. with uh, rehabilitation. We also talked to uh, folks down there uh, recognizing, for example, uh, transitional housing is going to be very important. You uh, release uh, someone from the jail and uh, they have no place to live and they decide to shack up with somebody and then they can't find a job. And so, uh, and, and they start using drugs again, they're not gonna be successful. So right, what we need to do is be sure that, so one of, some of the things that uh, my office has been trying to do, mm -hmm. working with other folks in the community, including the sheriff's office, is trying to also, uh, in addition to realignment, see if there's other types of resources that we can put together to help out trying to make uh, rehabilitation as successful as possible, because we can't afford to incarcerate our way out of our criminal justice problem. Okay, if we accept that as a premise, but councilman, fundamentally, doesn't this come down a lot of times to just having access to a job? In, in the boom of the 1990s when unemployment went down to 2%, mm -hmm. um, recidivism rates floated down 
all by themselves. Maybe not to the place where it is that we'd say that we had hit nirvana, mm -hmm. but how much of this is economically based? I think a bit significant part. I mean, I know that part of what we're trying to do is to actually do a utilize a professional uh, tool to us to do, to assess whether or not uh, the offender is likely to to reoffend and what their needs are. And based on using that that professional tool, it'll give us a much more honed in perspective on whether or not a, a job is likely to keep them from reoffending, or whether they need substance abuse and a, substance abuse services and a job, or whether they need job training. I mean, it, so it's going to give us a much better perspective on um, a focused population to determine what exactly do they need, what, what are the tools, that, what are the things that they're going to need coming back into our communities that's going to at least have the chance of reducing the likelihood that they're going to reoffend. And if you had to spend the money by yourself, Sheriff, how would you allocate it? You know, it's, it's difficult. You first have to cover the cost, and I've, one of my mantras to our, our CCP, our Community Corrections Partnership, the group that decides how the money is spent, is hard costs have to come before speculative or program costs. I have actual costs. I'm the only one in realignment that has real costs associated with it. Um, so those have to be paid for. Well, if I were to take all of my costs and get compensated for it, there'd be nothing left. So I guess in a perfect world, I would say cover as much cost as I need to get by but also give as much as we could, can to, to programs. We're, we're stuck with trying to make this work. This, I mean, there, there is a, a way to do realignment uh, deliberately, and like I said, with all the stakeholders looking at other states that have tried this. This iteration is none of those things, and my concern is this How iteration. How so? How is it none of those things? Well, you have to remember the only thing driving this, the only thing driving this, uh, and the implementation date of October 1 is the court order mandates. It's not because it was the, all the details were worked out. They certainly were not. It's not because it was sufficiently funded. It certainly was not. It's not because this was the best version um, after taking stakeholders' uh, input from ACLU, from educators, from uh, law enforcement officials, from other states. Uh, it, it was none of those things. The only thing that drove this was the October 1 implementation date. So, so Dr. Pan, that kind of flies in the face of uh, Rahm Emanuel's dictum of never waste a good crisis, does it not? <laughs> well, yeah, I, yeah, I think one of the things that uh, we did with the realignment uh, is, is that uh, we recognized that the current path we were on was not working. And in fact, that many times uh, local people are on the ground are gonna come up with better solutions. Uh, so while as difficult as this is, um, I think that uh, you know I certainly have a lot of uh, uh, faith and uh, and belief in the expertise of uh, the folks on the ground here in Sacramento County. Mm -hmm. And our office also isn't just like we pass you know we voted for it and we're stepping away. Uh, I've attended several community uh, partnership meetings. My staff is always there. We want to be a good partners with all the people at the county, uh, including the sheriff and the DA and the probation and you know, all the other people uh, in, in the cabinet to try to help work out solutions. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, I'd love if there was more money for it. Uh, I'd love to be able to do some other things. We're working on, again, trying to look at other potential types of resources we might be able to bring to the table. Uh, so we want to be good partners in trying to solve this problem. Uh, you know, as, as, as Oscar said, there's a lot of things we still haven't, you know, we still have to figure out. Uh, mm -hmm. We also need to be sure the funding is stable and the governor's initiative is going to guarantee, uh, you know, uh, funding. It doesn't bring in new money for that, but at least we, we need to be sure that's also predictable as well, well so that people can well, make long-term Well, speaking plans. of the governor, I want to read to all of you something. Uh, this is a quote from the governor at the time that uh, he made the announcement related mm -hmm. to realignment, and he says, Today I am pledging maximum state support to local officials, full funding, flexibility to use local solutions, and a future ballot measure guaranteeing continuous funding. We can't over overturn the Supreme Court decision, but we can work together to fix our broken system and protect public safety. Has the governor lived up to his pledge? Well, I believe that it's, you know, the guaranteed funding is part of the initiative. Uh, you know, when you say full or maximum funding, that can be uh, subject to different types of interpretations. Let's make but, it simple. Yes but, or no, did the governor live up to his pledge? I, I believe the governor has fundamentally lived up to his pledge. Has the governor lived up to his pledge? I, I think he's done everything he possibly can to make mm -hmm. sure that we are uh, in line to get the resources that we're needed. And I think there's going to be tweaks that are going to be needed, but mm -hmm. I think he's done what he can reasonably do thus far uh, to make sure that the money continues to flow so that we have our the, the most the maximum options on the table for our community. Sheriff, you agree with that assessment? No, uh, I would say kinda. 
Um, the reality is, is he has promised us both individually and as, as groups and state sheriffs and others that he would get this on the ballot as a constitutionally pr protected funding source. The reality is that the, the Association of Counties had a measure. This does not require new taxes to fund. This is a set aside from existing monies. Um, I sat in Senator Steinberg's office uh, before all this tax initiative came up and he asked me a question. Hey, you being a fiscal conservative, Scott, how are you going to get this passed? I said, there's no new taxes. I'll, I guarantee you I'll get it to pass in my county. The problem is you, the legislature, not you, Daryl Steinberg, will screw it up. Um, you will uh, find something that needs to be sexied up that's only polling at about 40 percent. The CSAC measure, the standalone measure, was polling at over 70 percent, and that you will attach it to something that needs to be brought up, and that's exactly what happened. There are no new taxes required to set aside the funding for realignment. That's what the governor promised us. So true, he did get it on the measure, uh, get it on as a measure, but the reality is the only way to get consistent protected funding uh, for realignment is to vote in the governor's tax measures, which, depending on the day in the poll, may or may not pass. I see. Well, what's interesting about this is that when the governor made this announcement, he had an impressive cross-section of government officials with him. Sheriffs, county supervisors, city police chiefs, district attorneys. What is it that they're thinking differently than you are? Well, I, I can't say that in total because you know I'm, I'm relatively new at this job, but I can tell you that the State Sheriff's Association mm -hmm. um, voted uh, with one exception to support the governor's tax measure, or the governor's uh, realignment plan. The one holdout was myself. I don't think there's anything in this for the counties, and specifically I don't think there's anything in this for the sheriffs. And so I met with Secretary Kate, I met with the governor before I did come out, uh, and told them all I was going to come out against this, and, and I did. So, as a consequence, how is behavior changing in the street? I, I, I'm curious about whether or not you're seeing through your staff and Councilman, whether you're hearing about through your staff mm -hmm. that there is a moving of the needle with regards to criminal activity. Well, I'd love to be able to sit here and say that, uh, you know, all heck is broken loose because of realignment. Um, we don't have the data to suggest that. I think, as, as K the councilman suggested, it's, it's too early to tell. I can tell you that in crime in every single category in the county of Sacramento has gone up over last year. As compared to years former ago, years? As compared to former years. Most of those are uh, within the two to six percent range, so uh, not significant spikes. I know there has been unless it's happening to you. Well, that that is a spike. Um, in the city, they're also going up. Violent crime is going up faster than the than the property crimes in the city, if I recall uh, Chief Brazil's uh, comments. Um, so it's too early to tell if there's realignment related, but I can tell you that speaking with my contemporaries around the state, uh, there's an increase in the number of officer-involved shootings, there's an increase in the number of uh, crime. Many jails are uh, uh, having to release inmates early as well as not accept certain inmates because of capacity issues created by realignment. So the consequences, um, even though we can't directly attribute them and say realignment's causing this, there are some disturbing trends that happen to coincide with the implementation of realignment. I don't think it's going to get better in the short what I'm, term. What I'm really looking to find out is whether or not behavior is changing with regards to the people that your staff combats on a daily basis, whether or not there's a lack of consequences or perception that increasingly there is a lack of consequences for action. That's a very good point and I think as much as anything it's the diminishment of consequences that has resulted in increased criminality. You've got, um, it used to be if someone was a, a parolee, I mean let's face it, we know who's committing the crimes. The best predictor of future behavior is past conduct. We know who's committing the crimes with the 70 percent certainty. Um, so we had the ability, if you're on parole for example, to uh, search you, make sure you're complying with the law. If, you, if we found you with some drugs, we could arrest you, violate your parole, the parole would be violated, you'd be back in prison, doing a year in prison within a week. Now we can't uh, because you don't go back to prison. The worst consequence you can get now for violation of your post-release community supervision, this new hybrid, is six months, but remember that's half time. So the worst, whatever cost-benefit analysis that criminals do, um, your worst consequence now is only three months. So we see this with the drugs. Now we have Prop 36 and drug diversion. There's very little to no consequences, at least for your first drug offense, unless you're transporting large amounts. We're seeing it on the ballot measure this, this fall. They're trying to get rid of the the third strike requirement being any felony. They're trying to get rid of the death penalty. You see a further diminishment of consequences driven solely by the economy because mm -hmm. now it's expensive 
uh, without regard to mm -hmm. public safety. So yes, I, that's a consideration. All right. We're down to our final moments. And uh, for the public, how do we get involved? Well, how do we make sure that our voices are heard as mm -hmm. your constituents, the citizens you protect, the folks that you represent? Right. And I'll start with you, Dr. Pan. Well, you know, I think this is a problem that we all need to pull together to figure out. And uh, I think things that people can do, certainly we want to hear from folks. We want to uh, listen to law enforcement, try to figure out how we can solve problems, see what resources we can put together. At the same time, the best way to, uh, to stop crime is actually prevention. So things that we can do to help uh, prov uh, provide opportunities for youth and also people getting together like neighborhood watches and so forth right. that they can support We're, we're going to have to leave it right there. Councilman, you have 15 seconds. So three quick things. First of all, I would say uh, you, you can go to the, see what your countywide plan is uh, mm -hmm. by going to the chief probation officer's website because every county plan is posted on there. So it's a great resource to go as a resident to look at, see what your plan is, see what your county is saying they're going right. to be doing. We're, we're going to have to leave it there. Okay. I, I apologize. And you get the last word, Sheriff. First, understand that all of us, including uh, Dr. Pan and everybody, is working hard to make this work. Just because we don't like it doesn't mean we're throwing our sucker in the sand. And secondly is to get involved. Come, They're all public meetings, the That's CCP right. meetings. Yep. Come and see what it's all about and voice, have your voice heard. Anyone, uh, how, many, how many residents, just pure residents, show up at these meetings? Give me just a numerical guesstimate. Half a dozen. Half a dozen? Yeah. Yeah. Meaning, <laughs> meaning that we need more people involved. Absolutely. A very important issue. Thank you all for being with us here today. Thank you. Well, that's our show. Thanks to our guests and thanks to you for watching. For Studio Sacramento, I'm Scott Syfax. See you next time right here on KVIE. I'm James Beckwith, President and CEO of Five Star Bank. As a community bank, we believe that open dialogue about the issues affecting our region is vitally important. From the economy to the environment to social issues, we look forward to the conversations and hope you'll join in.